Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Cost Management, Supply Chain Improvement, and more, Health System Priorities in a Post-Pandemic World. I am Aliyah Pavla with Becker's Hospital Review. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. We are looking forward to hearing your questions. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link you use to log into today's webinar to access the recording. At this time, it is now my pleasure to start today's webinar by introducing Sean McBride. Sean is the Vice President and General Manager for Wavemark Supply Management and Workforce Workflow Solutions at Cardinal Health. Sean is an international business leader with more than 20 years of healthcare experience in a variety of leadership positions in general management, sales, marketing, sourcing, and operational excellence. In his current role, he is responsible for the global operations of this commercial technology business, driving effective clinical and financial outcomes for healthcare through managed services enabled by prescriptive data. At this time, I am pleased to turn the floor over to Sean to begin today's presentation. Aaliyah, thank you very much. And on behalf of Cardinal Health and HIMSS, let me welcome you to today's webinar. We're grateful that you took the time to join us and I'm really excited about the conversation today. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce to everyone Dr. Ann Snowden, uh, who will be driving our conversation today. Uh, Dr. Snowden has an impressive and distinguished career, um, and I would like to highlight two of those impressive accomplishments. Uh, she is currently the Scientific Director and CEO of Supply Chain Advancement Network in Healthcare, the SCAN Health, which is the global network to advance supply chain infrastructure and health systems. She is also the developer of the Clinically Integrated Supply Outcomes Model, CSUM, which will be the thrust of today's conversation. In addition, that is the Digital Health Indicator, which was launched by HEMS earlier this year. And with that, Dr. Stoughton uh, will be helping us achieve three objectives today. Number one, uh, as we're all facing the impacts of COVID, we're struggling with the question of what can healthcare supply chains do to help us now and into the future? That'll be our top objective today. Number two is to really dive deeper and define that clinically integrated supply outcomes model. And number three, we hope everyone will walk away with some tangible and very actionable practices for helping to improve our supply chain maturity. And with that, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Dr. Snowden. John, thank you so much for the opportunity to share this work uh, with you and the audience today. I am uh, just delighted to uh, share where some of the opportunities and really critical um, central issues are now unfolding with a, a rather unprecedented global pandemic. I don't think any of us have actually ever quite seen before, and this is really an opportunity to as they say, never waste a crisis, um, but really understand how it can be leveraged to motivate uh, moving health systems forward. So let me begin with what virtually every global system is challenged by, and that is the simple issue of capacity. When in such a pandemic, the rapid surge in cases we have seen all over the world is a um, incredible demand on health systems to pivot from day-to-day -day capacity that's very well measured and managed uh, uh, to ensure patients receive care to a capacity that's just unprecedented in terms of its numbers and the very critical nature of people, uh, patients who are experiencing COVID-19. And the only way to manage that capacity is really those measures to slow the curve, if you will, flattening the curve, as we have all been um, very much participating as citizens in a number of countries. But that's not the only challenge that health systems have faced for a, vet for a long time. It just happens to be today. Medical error um, is one of the original reasons why I began the work of developing such a clinically integrated outcomes model. It remains, at least it did until the pandemic, a third leading cause of death. And that has not changed 
in the last 10 years, there are multiple and different um, uh, data indicators and evidence around that. And that is most directly a supply chain a challenge and opportunity to advance quality and safety of our health systems. One example, and this is really just one, is ability of a health system to track and trace a product that is used in a clinical procedure. In this case, this graphic shows a, a hip implant. And the case that many of you are probably aware of is that Dupuy hip implant was installed in 500,000 patients worldwide. It's a metal-on-metal -metal prosthesis. And again, and another 40,000 actually in the UK. In today, there is not a health system that has the digital infrastructure that can tell you exactly which patient has that product, that hip implant, only to find that since that was on the market, a number of those patients are suffering with catastrophic heart failure uh, and high mortality rates. And we today as health systems just don't know who they are with the exception of sending Google ads out to make to, to try and have people identify themselves. So that for me is a supply chain challenge and issue that, that just needs to be fixed um, over and above what we're seeing today in this pandemic. Uh, another one is of course the whole issue of precision medicine and precision care delivery. Our citizens in virtually every country expect great quality of care, like it's, it's what we all hope for and we all assume we'll receive. This graphic is just an illustration of how accurate are we. The red people and the blue people are a relative number of populations receiving the top 10 most prescribed drugs in the U.S. And you'll recognize many of them, Nexium, Crestor, um, Advair for asthma. The red people on this graphic are the relative number of people who receive value and, and those drugs are working very well for, for them. The blue people are the numbers of people prescribed those drugs who either receive no value from those drugs or may experience harm. The catch is our supply chain infrastructure in most health systems don't know who those red people are so that we can be sure they get the drug that works for them. And just as importantly, who are the blue people in our respective health systems that aren't going to get any benefit from that drug and may even experience harm? That's a supply chain challenge and one that the technologies are there and in place. The health system digital infrastructure needs to advance to a point where we can get right to that individual person. And then we overlay that with where are we today in the pandemic. A very senior clinician uh, in another country shared with me his perception was we are completely flying blind. We have rapid numbers of cases of COVID. We have a rapid and significant demand for need for protective equipment, a picture here that many have seen on, on the social media. And yet the ability of our supply chain infrastructure to ramp up capacity quickly enough to support um, PP, our health workforce with PPE protection uh, has been a huge challenge. Workforce safety has emerging as a very significant outcome already. Estimated 90,000 nurses alone have been infected with COVID and the ICN believes that number is possibly double, but we actually don't know what the actual number is. Country level competition and even jurisdiction organization competition to find those products that we need to support our healthcare workers to be safe and that of course resulting in a global shortage. These are very, very substantive. Uh, challenges, and these are all about how well our supply chain infrastructure operates as a strategic asset in our health systems, not just within country, but across countries, so that every global citizen can expect and be confident in the uh, care that they are receiving. Quick summary of the emerging research we are conducting at this very moment on what are the impacts we are starting to see on COVID-19 on health systems, safety front and center. There is now a critical link between the ability of supply chain capacity to protect our workforce and make it possible for health systems to deliver care. I cannot understate how central that is for virtually every health system we have engaged. Now I think I'm up to about 12 countries. 
Lack of transparency, that's the flying blind concept. Right at the cold face for those nurses, physicians, and allied health and clinician teams, they don't know if they have the equipment they need to stay safe and PPE being just one of those. Cost, I don't think anyone has accurate estimates of the cost and the impact of what this pandemic is now um, creating. But costs of, of infrastructure and supply chain now, I believe, will be a very central issue for many global uh, and very health, many health system leaders. And then the issue of relying on single jurisdictions, single geographies for our source of supplies. Uh, certainly China holds many of the manufacturers um, of PPE products specifically. They were the first to be quarantined in this pandemic, hence the domino effect of supply chain shortages now is what all health systems are really working very hard to manage. So the, the, the impact of supply chain infrastructure, transparency, technology, ability to track and trace what products do we have, what do we need, how quickly are we using them, particularly in a time like we find ourselves, is, is really the opportunity now for health systems to better understand a supply chain as a strategic asset in health system performance in a time where we find ourselves today an unprecedented pandemic challenge. But moving forward beyond post-pandemic, where is that going to uh, now need to achieve uh, health system performance as health systems start to recover from uh, what they're now experiencing in, in the um, rapid surge of this first phase? So let me move to what do we mean by supply chain because we can certainly all see the value and the opportunity here, but exactly what is a clinically integrated uh, supply outcomes model? First of all, defining supply chain, supply chain infrastructure, many people think of it as simply can we source the products we need and make sure they get to those clinical teams who need them. And I would say it's beyond that and particularly now as we're experiencing this pandemic. Supply chain infrastructure is that digital tracking and traceability of every care product used in every care procedure at the individual patient level, provided and, and managed by provider teams, linked to patient care and individual outcomes. So think back to the challenge of the hip implant, which became, became very quickly evident that it was causing heart failure. Unless we're tracking and tracing care delivery and products to individual patients, we cannot know what patients are now at risk because of uh, the challenge of product performance. And I, that is not just about product performance. Today we're now seeing it in terms of do we have all of the medications and therapies we're going to need for our next set of COVID patients? It's about drugs and products and even care procedures. And that very broad definition of supply chain is quite important. The clinically integrated outcomes model has is, is been developed on the basis of about eight years of research. It's been validated and tested in three continents, five countries, eight health systems, and has been released on the market as late, just in late November, just prior uh, to the pandemic. It is an eight-level uh, maturity tool. I, it was originally seven, but you may find interesting that um, in our early testing of this in a Delphi study, people came back to me and said, Anne, you're far too optimistic uh, with level one. You need to go to a level zero. So I think it speaks to we have some work to do on uh, supply chain infrastructure, um, particularly the digital nature of that in infrastructure. And here's what I mean by supply chain infrastructure. Clinically integrated supply chain means that today the majority or many supply chain data is in our ERP systems, right? All the ordering of products and, and whether we've got you know, electronic data interchange with our vendors and manufacturers. It's integrating that supply chain infrastructure digitally into patient care EMRs. So now you've got what that creates is an integrated data set so that you can link what products were used in that particular surgery or cardiac cath lab or interventional radiology. And let's analyze those, those patient outcomes and figure out what's working best for whom and under what conditions. With that analytics engine underneath it, it now allows you to predict. So, for example, one area of work we, we've spent some time on is can we predict 
joint implant failure, if we mobilize all that joint uh, registry data, but it ties exactly to an clinically integrated outcomes model in a health system that knows which hip plant implant was used for which patients, and then proactively identify risk or potential failure before too many patients actually experience it. So the clinically integrated component of supply chain is about embedding the supply chain data infrastructure right into patient records at the individual patient level, which allows us to do the following, and this is just a quick snapshot of the outcomes of a clinically integrated outcomes model. It certainly begins with global standards. So there are, what we're finding in this uh, pandemic, one of our big challenges is how many names there are for a single product. Standardizing what we identify as a product, and there's been much work done in the U.S. on that with UDI, has to use a global standard because the manufacturer of that product could be anywhere in the world. Very quickly, when you start to automate and integrate your your inventory into um, uh, a much more automated uh, environment, you get inventory optimization. In the early research we have uh, findings we have created, there's a seven to one return on investment, and all of that is coming from s the savings from lack of uh, from decreasing waste. So as soon as you start to automate your inventory, link it to individual patient care processes and procedures, what we're finding on average, and this is three countries, five different health systems, is they're seeing a savings of about seven to one. So if it costs a million dollars to implement a system in a, in a hospital, what we're seeing is seven to nine million return on that investment in the 14, first 14 months because they're no longer throwing out all the products they've been ordering for decades. And we tend to order over order in health systems because, trust me, I'm a nurse, you don't ever want to run out of something when you're standing with a surgeon in an operating room. So we tend so one of the outcomes we're seeing is that, and I'll come back to that later. Product traceability then becomes automated. You know who has that particular implant or stent or or mesh or whatever product, so you can proactively identify who may be at risk. You can track your quality and safety outcomes. We're also seeing that in these very advanced systems where they know right down to the individual surgeon how long he typically takes in his OR time. What is the cost of the supplies and products he or she tends to use? And is that mapping and comparing to all his colleagues in that particular um, group or area of specialist, and is it typical for the types of patients he happens to be working with. So that transparency of outcomes becomes critically important now to inform decisions on how to optimize not just what supplies, products, solutions a health system is using, but, but to optimize and inform decisions on how do we make sure every one of our patients gets those same best outcomes as that cohort that we've identified um, across a particular patient population. That's when the predictive artificial intelligence tools now are able to prescribe what's likely to work best right at the individual patient level because that integrated data set is now set up for those advanced analytics to really inform decisions in near real time with real world evidence. And if there's one hallmark of this particular uh, clinically integrated outcomes model, uh, I would say that's probably it. What does it look like clinically? This is from a health system that we have actually tested it in. And what they would tell you is this clinically integrated outcomes model helps us as an organization shift from waiting to some first things to happen, the reactive approach we tend to take. So waiting for those next 40 people to come through Emerge to realize we have a problem to, to shifting towards a predictive proactive model. So we anticipate knowing given our, our data assets and the, um, the transparency we have across our system, we can now predict what we're likely to see and we can act upon what we're likely to see. And in one of these organizations during the pandemic, they knew their long-term care residents were going to be at greater risk for infection. So rather than wait for them to have an outbreak, what they did was send supplies and staff to every one of their long-term care settings proactively to keep them safe, and they kept their numbers down in terms of COVID infections dramatically compared to their other cohorts. 
here's a typical, when I say transparency, here, here's just a snapshot, and I've seen many of these. It's a dashboard that in real time tracks your inventory. This happens to be PPE inventory because that's so front and center right now. The impact of having that much transparency right at the individual nurse and physician level, what we're starting to see in this data is it's building confidence in the workforce. So those nurses and physicians can see that they have seven or 30 or 60 days of inventory. So it reduces their anxiety. It eases that fear and that uncertainty, and they're not seeing the challenges others are seeing with nurses and physicians that are concerned about coming back to work or, or call in sick or have long absentee rates. So it, even though we, we think of supply chain as availability of products, What's starting to unfold is it's about confidence that that system can provide to clinical teams the products they need to deliver quality and safe care. And when they don't have that confidence, that presents tremendous challenges for a number of um, organizations and leaders. So what are the four dimensions of um, the, the clinically integrated outcomes model? Number one, for sure, automation. It makes it easier for health uh, teams. They automatically capture data, whether that's an RFID tag sensor or that's a swipe of a barcode, so that you take the burden off, particularly nurses and physicians, documenting what particular product was used in that care procedure. Clinical integration, it puts that transparency in dashboards in the hands of clinicians who know best which of these products are going to work best for which patients. Predictive analytics, talked about that a bit already, is mobilizing that clinically integrated data and now measuring what are we achieving for which of our population segments and how can we optimize and make it better. And of course, governance and leadership, no surprise, it's critically important that the C-suite leadership level understands and sees our supply chain as the strategic asset that it is. So, Sean, I know I've covered a huge waterfront of what supply <laughs> chain's about and what CSOM is, so forgive me. Uh, so back to you in terms of I, I hope that's given people a flavor of really, really the opportunity before all of us today. This is great, Dr. Snow. Thank you so much. And it is about just getting an understanding of the models so we can continue the conversation here. But I do think it's important to just recognize that a lot of the work you've shared is relatively new. Your research yeah. is ongoing. And uh, quite frankly, in today's environment, where every day it seems like the healthcare environment is changing due to the pandemic, um, I think that's very appropriate. And so as we go forward and transition, it'll be really helpful for us to understand what are those results that you're finding as part of the research? Uh, when someone looks at the maturity model, when they adopt this uh, approach, what are those impacts that they're going to see? And I think in the next couple of slides, that's where you're yeah. going to give us a preview. And as you suggest, you're absolutely right. It's unfolding as we go. But the early work is profiled here. I did a deep dive case study in three countries. And the reason being that this is a supply chain is a global opportunity and challenge. Supplies don't come within each country's or jurisdiction's border, so you really have to understand how such a model operates. Whether you're a publicly funded system in Canada, a revenue-driven system in the U.S., or some version of, of both, perhaps in this case, England. So just a snapshot, and these are widely available, and I'm happy to share these uh, case studies with anyone who would like them. Uh, in the Canadian scene, um, at a whole, we studied a whole province. The province of Alberta is about the landmass of your state of Texas uh, with a population of about 4.5 million people. So that's typical Canada, right? Huge landmass, not very many of us. But what they've already posted with audited financial statements is $301 million savings in this, in this seven-year period. Now, bearing in mind, over the case of that seven years, it was only the last two or three where the infrastructure had been advanced to a point where it was really generating uh, the, the supply savings. That, by the way, is the only jurisdiction in Canada who had no supply shortages at the height of the first uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, which I think is noteworthy. 
Uh, in England, we looked at six of the NHS trusts. They tended to be a range of the smaller ones in the north, of course, the very large academic health science type of NHS trusts, um, more central to that country. They, too, uh, that case study was completed just 18 months after they had started implementing a clinically integrated outcomes model. They had posted a four-to-one return on investment 18 months in. They are projecting and are in the process of scaling to all 150 trusts as we speak, and they're projecting a 30 million pound savings um, per month. Now, what's important here is this: an, these are annualized savings. When you implement, you don't just get your great uh, supply waste, you know, reduction savings on year one, and then the rest um, is not. It doesn't change. These are an, what we're seeing is annual savings. Um, of 30%, and you'll see that in the U.S. system, uh, almost 30% decline in labor costs. That's primarily because of the automation and those predictive analytics tools. So there's not a lot of time wasted documenting, tracking, figuring out what we're short of, what we need. And that served those systems extremely well in this very dynamic environment called a pandemic. 33% uh, decline in uh, waste of supply costs. So what we're finding is regardless of the context of the health system operates, publicly funded, privately funded, or a mix of both, all of them are posting very comparable significant returns on investment in cost only um, within 14 to 18 months. The reason I don't have data on safety, like reduction of error, for example, is because that's not something that's always easy to publicly um, publish. I will share with you anecdotally that in every one of these health systems case leadership shared with me, they saw a dramatic decline in error, particularly the most serious error we call never events. In most cases, a 70% decline in errors like, you know, wrong drug to wrong patient or wrong surgery on wrong body part, etc. So that's something that's difficult to surface um, uh, publicly in terms of evidence, but it was consistent in the qualitative interviews I conducted in each setting. Uh, another quick snapshot of a, a U.S. system. Here are the more updated um, by by type of program. You'll notice perioperative, $41 million in savings over a five-year period. It's almost, you know, closing in about eight, nine million per year. Cath lab, similarly, and nursing labor costs in 1.4 million. What we're finding across all of the countries right now is people start in those very high cost, high um, impact areas in perioperative surgery, cath lab, interventional radiology. And that's, you know, higher the cost, greater the savings. And then just one more quick one is that we often think about it's just cost, and, and it really is more than that. The findings we're seeing on each of these case studies that we're now continuing to collect data on is quadruple aim. So we're seeing improvement in provider experience and quality of work life, primarily because it's reducing labor time to do the work of the documentation, for example, just one example. A nurse shared with me, she's a young nurse, she said, Ann, I'll never work in another hospital that doesn't have this clinically integrated supply chain because it, it saves me four hours per case in her particular area of surgery, which happened to be orthopedics. Improved patient outcomes. Um, we're only starting now to see accurate evidence of that anecdotally, reducing um, errors in upwards of 70%. I had a Canadian health system tell me that they've dropped their medication errors 90%, and they are hoping to achieve 100% free medication errors, which for me as a nurse is pretty remarkable. Uh, patient experiences, really that's about, patient, that's about transparency. We've not interviewed uh, uh, patient data particularly, um, but the confidence in knowing what products they now can um, have in the particular surgery uh, we think will be quite significant. And then I've showed data already on the lower cost of care. So the evidence is mounting. You're absolutely right. It is a very new model introduced on the heels or just prior to a pandemic unfolding. Uh, and we're collecting data through the pandemic because that becomes a very important, stressful time in health systems that help us even better understand how a clinically integrated outcomes model is performing. And I can say with those three case studies I just showed you, all three of those systems are reporting to me they have not had 
the severe shortages of PPE, because, and they feel it's exactly because the transparency, the digital infrastructure, informing their decisions, and proactively planning and managing their capacity and demand. So I think that's an interesting outcome just starting to emerge. So back to you, Sean. All right, you've got us excited. Uh, you've got us <laughs> on the precipice of understanding how to go forward with this. And, and you've also got I me mean, personally excited because as you said, we traditionally thought about supply chain and that availability, you know, get product right. from point A to point B. But, but the truth is the opportunity for it to be a strategic asset is there. And we've got to unlock that opportunity. Yeah. Um, the next phase for us is to think about supply chain uh, enabling that digital health. And yeah. in truth, when, when I talk to customers and even myself as a consumer, when I start to think about digital health, I jump to some of the big you know, goals of machine yeah. learning and yeah. uh, artificial intelligence. But I think what you've shared along the way is that there are some important milestones that we need to make sure that we enable. And some of them that you referenced were around things like simple item numbers and how we code and treat a particular item. Uh, the second I thought was really interesting was to enable the automation, you've got to make sure that you have the connectivity between your ERP or EHR or other systems that help drive that. And the supply chain sometimes gets overlooked in that space. So as we go to this next phase, Walk us through, please, what is that first step for digital health? Yep, and that you have raised some incredibly important issues that even if we thought they were true, what seems to be unfolding almost before our eyes. Supply chain, as you rightly point out, is a critical strategic asset for health systems that if nothing else in this pandemic has shone a very bright light on just how critical it is. It's really about the safety of not only our patients, we knew that already, but our workforce and our ability of our workforce to deliver the wonderful care they are all um, motivated and capable of driving. So in this uh, really graphic, you see the building blocks of a digital health ecosystem, and I want it's important we understand where supply chain fits. So of course, foundational, every, every digital health ecosystem must have a very strong governance and workforce strategy. That workforce strategy is how well are we enabling our workforce. And just one of those in this case today is about PPE. Tomorrow, it's transparency of the data to know how are we doing and what are we achieving for in terms of outcomes for our patients. But in order to do that, you've got to have democratization of data. You've got to be able to mobilize data. In this case, the clinically integrated outcomes model mobilizes your ERP data and then maps it to and integrates it with your patient data. So that's providing great interoperable flow of data across health systems in real time, right on those dashboards that we, sh we showed a moment ago. But that data is only as good as our ability to apply analytics and create the evidence and knowledge and insights of outcomes. And then that traceability of outcomes is a very, very important outcome of a high-performing, highly clinically enabled supply chain. And it's the heart of the ecosystem digitally that gets us to the capacity to meaningfully engage with our patient populations to help them stay healthy and well. We're all trying to do that today. We're trying to get people to wear their masks, socially distance, stay safe. That's what's driving population health and wellness. But unless we have that very clinically integrated supply chain right across the journey of care, wherever a patient happens to engage a health system, then we can't get there. And I think that's something that's really an important role that supply chain perhaps hasn't been viewed, to your point, Sean, nearly uh, as accurately in the past. But I do believe it's a silver lining. It's a key lesson all health systems are learning uh, in the midst of this very challenging time. The health indicator is a, is a tool we've developed at HIMSS to help health systems understand what's their digital health capacity, their capacity to mobilize their and democratize their data and analyze it and, and to track how well they're doing. There's four dimensions here in a digital health indicator. We look at interoperability of data we've just spoken to. Person enabled, how much do we engage and connect to our, our patients and are we able to do so in such a way that we help them stay well and in this case um, prevent 
uh, transmission from the virus? How well are we using analytics and how strong is our governance and workforce? So that DHI indicator has threads of the clinically integrated outcomes model embedded in it. So if you're a level C, about four or five in the clinically integrated outcomes maturity model, your digital health um, capacity as a health system, we're just mapping that now, but it's quite advanced because you're that far up the pyramid. And I think that's an important uh, piece to sort of put in position. It's not just about supply chain. It's how supply chain, integrated supply chain outcomes model advances the digital health capacity of a health system. What would someone expect to see if you actually got there and you're level four or five, you know, in many or all of those key areas of digital maturity? What you are driving towards and what we're seeing is a mature digital health ecosystem, one that in real time can mobilize data, analyze that data to understand are we achieving the outcomes we'd like to and we, we hope we're achieving and for whom. And where we find our outcomes are not as strong as they should be, then we shift our models of care and our supply innovation strategies and make sure that we're able to deliver the care this, these cohorts of people need. We test it, and for those new models and approaches that are working, you scale it across the system. This is a learning health system that's digitally enabled, and that's a key outcome of, an, of, a, of advancing clinically integrated supply outcomes model, and that's really where I would say supply chain plays such an important role, Sean. Yeah, thank you, and I love that, as you said, it's a learning uh, process and system, and the truth is right now, I think most of us are trying to learn and probably struggling at the same time with the pandemic, and as a health system, you know, we're, we're looking for strategies, we're looking for the solutions, as you said earlier, to help us not only stop flying blind, but really begin to advance care in a different way. And so um, I, I imagine a lot of us on the phone today and on the webcast are probably a little bit overwhelmed with the current uh, <laughs> yeah. situation. And one of, our, one of our hopes today is that we're gonna walk out with some very tangible next steps. And so if we can, as we transition, why don't we start talking about where do we start and how do we make this less overwhelming? And I think this is a great place for us to start as always, which is, what about the patient, right? What do right. we think about patient experience and patient outcomes? So if you don't mind sharing with us, what does that look like as you mature? What would be some of those best practices? Yeah, yeah no question. Um, one of the things we are only starting to learn to do, and of course it's been driven by the whole digital thinking around apps and tools, right? And in the midst of this pandemic, of course, we all, many health systems, switched very quickly to virtual so virtually having a visit with our clinical teams, what a, what a clinically integrated outcome supply chain does is it actually drives data right to the point of care, right to the smartphone of that patient if that's what they choose to use, or a tablet, or maybe it's that virtual um, platform a health system's using, so that those patients are getting those cues of using analytics to say, gee, and you know, your, your sugars are starting to just start to look like they may not be as good as we'd like them to be. So it's cueing patients directly based on their data to help them help themselves stay healthy and well. So imagine being the mom of a husband or the wife of a husband at home with COVID. Imagine having the uh, the tracking traceability right in the palm of my hands as a caregiver, hoping my husband's going to be okay with this COVID. For patients, this is the meaningful connection we talk about in digital health that's completely enabled, really, by that supply chain infrastructure to know who is that patient, what care have they received virtually or in person, and is it achieving the outcomes it should be? And by the way, what products have been tried and are perhaps achieving great outcomes that we need to be thinking about for other patients in a similar scenario? So this is really meaningfully connecting to our patients in a new way by giving them the data and the the cues from an analytics perspective to understand how best to stay healthy and well. If ever there was a time we needed this in a pandemic, th this is the time. Absolutely. And um, you also, earlier on, you mentioned medication errors being a third leading, leading cause of death pre-pandemic. Yep. 
And with this visibility that you talk about, what, what would we expect to see in terms of a positive change in that, right? And yeah. with these yeah. characteristics that we're talking about, how does that play out for folks that are on the line? Yeah, no, and, and medical error generally, not just medications. Medication fat must be one of the bigger ones, but you're Sorry, absolutely you. right, Sean. The more we engage a patient, we know that if patients have access to their own data and are tracking their health progress and goals, this is well established in the literature, error goes down. Because patients have the information and the knowledge to know, I think that's the wrong dose. I have been on, you know, for example, 50 milligrams up until now, and this pharmacist uh, label says it's 100. So they help become that double check. When a product is recalled, because you have direct connectivity to every individual patient and where and when and who has that particular product that's been used, now you can notify and you can connect to them immediately in terms of helping mitigate the risk of such a product should it have been perhaps recalled or there's some early evidence that it's not achieving the value it should. So patients become the advocates for their own health and wellness, but they're only able to do so because we're, eight, we're flowing data right to them and helping them make sense of that data using analytics tools. Just like, you know, you think of the, the analogy, when we go on a shopping site, Amazon, for example, Amazon tells you, hey, here's the last seven things you looked at. We, we're used to that as consumers. What this is achieving is making that a standard opportunity in healthcare to help people make good decisions based on what their needs, values, and unique life circumstances are. And it's really just bringing that same capability and capacity to health systems. Well said. Thank you so much. Um, so let's transition on to the next uh, focus on the quadruple aim, and, and that is equally important around staff sat satisfaction. And yeah, nope. I would say over, over the years in healthcare, we can we always focus appropriately so on burnout and what's happening with our staff and the, and the yep. stresses and demands that are happening. That has only gotten greater. Right during the pandemic, we've seen even more and more of that. And I was struck by by the data you shared earlier, which is the assumption is 90,000 healthcare workers have been infected by COVID worldwide. I mean, that's a, a shocking number that sometimes doesn't get enough publicity. And so everyone is worried about their safety. That, that is absolutely true. If you would please just share with us, again, in the same maturity and best practices, how right. can we look to improve staff sat with a you know, mature supply chain model? No, no question. And if ever there was something I'm seeing in Technicolor, uh, it's this one right now. Um, the ability for every individual health provider to have access to that data on what do we need, what am I going to need, and what's working best for my patients, that's the transparency piece. And having that, that dashboard we showed that, that I know as a nurse manager, for example, I've got 30 days of N95 masks and my nurses in my unit have the confidence that they have, they have what they need to be safe. So that transparency and access to data right at the point of care for a nurse, clinician, physician, surgeon, I think will be becoming of much greater importance as we now move into recovery and post-pandemic phases and supply chain data right at those dashboard levels, then real time they're accurate, gets out of the flying blind. And one thing about being a health provider, and I spent many years in that role myself, that confidence is immeasurable. And that confidence makes it possible for me to be able to deliver the best possible care to every individual patient and family. And this is really, I think, a, a key predictor of the strength of our health workforces globally uh, going, going forward. And Sean, we may have just uh, lost you on on audio, so jump in when you're able to join us again. But it Thank was, was you, oh, there sorry. you go. Okay, sorry, I thought Thank maybe so I much. lost you. <laughs> Technology is wonderful. It is, and I was just going to say, so we have to acknowledge there is a bit of a downside to technology. Not just me keeping myself on mute, but clinicians. <laughs> 
will sometimes view that technology you just talked about, enabling them to see how many N95 masks they have, is yet just another screen in my way, another something I have to adjust to. And right. one of the things that may be an initial obstacle that people on the phone will face is, how do we work through those changes, the change management that comes with that, to really help us recognize that at the end of this is more time and greater patient care? And so maybe share some experiences yeah, or your thoughts on that. That's such a great question, and I get that question a lot because as as many of us are likely on our call today have experienced just how hard change is. One of the things in the early case studies, and bear in mind this is pre-pandemic, of course, that was very, very uh, compelling was the moment, because a clinically integrated supply chain infrastructure can now track and trace every patient, every process of care they've received by providers and what products were used. These same health systems, like NHS being one I can think of, produce dashboards for every individual surgeon. So, uh, you know, Dr. Snowden, uh, the surgeon, gets the, the dashboard that says, oh, you've just completed your case in four hours and 16 minutes at a cost of X, and here's how it ranks against your other colleagues. What we're seeing, and this is early in terms of evidence, but what we're seeing is the moment you surface that kind of data for clinicians, they immediately go to, I can do better. I can make those numbers. I can create better outcomes for my patients because you've shared it with them. And when when current health systems without development supply chains, what we rely on are all those retrospective clinical decision support things, like here's the data from the last year. That data is not unique and specific to the Dr. Snowdens or Dr. Smiths or Dr. Sean's, right? The moment you provide those individual clinicians their performance outcomes, what I saw was change management strategies are, are almost overnight changed. They know exactly what to do with that data. They lead that change. You don't have to convince them. The objectivity and the data it provides gives them the tools to know what could be done to improve those numbers, which is very much that learning health system concept. So what I'm seeing is literally overnight changes in surgeons using their personal data that's mapped and tracked against their colleagues in a particular group. One chief of staff said to me, Anne, every month we review everybody's outcomes and we make a decision as a team as to how to improve them. I've been a nurse a very long time. I haven't seen that level of engagement and that literal change overnight in terms of how they can now mobilize and act on this very important data and they see the value of that data. It's so encouraging the way you describe that and, and that we're getting close there. But it does beg one final question from us mm -hmm. before we open up to the rest of the audience, which is, how do you achieve that enterprise visibility? That is what we're striving for. You gave great examples earlier about health systems that, that find savings when they have that visibility, that the traceability leads to uh, better outcomes from the patient and, and overall cost savings. Share with us just those practical examples, please, and, and let us know how we'll know if we're doing well or not based on the characteristics. Yeah, no question. I guess if there's a, an old saying that, that suits that question, it's this one. You can't manage what you can't measure. And essentially <laughs> what this at the enterprise level, what this advancing your supply chain infrastructure really means is you've created the transparency and the data and the automation so that it's so easy to see your progress over time and that data is flowing in real time so that you're now able to leverage that and make decisions in real time. So now you have the analytics, and now you have the data that says, gee, you know, our outcomes should be much better compared to our last, you know, three weeks, three days, whatever that time frame is. That also allows you to forecast. So analytics now allow you to say, okay, based on your last 300 patients that went through that particular procedure or surgery or cardiac cath or whatever it was, this particular patient is at greater risk. This is where your machine learning comes into place of the following. So it's now shifting health systems from waiting for someone to get sick or waiting for something to go wrong and then responding to proactively knowing 
who are the patients I most need to worry about, what programs are most um, leading in terms of our outcomes, what programs need to um, do we need to focus our efforts on to help them get to those same best outcomes. And this is all about transparency and about leadership. Clinician leadership can't underestimate the importance of that, but C-suite leadership. So this data flows into those strategic decision-making discussions on what are we doing well, how do we leverage those successes so that every program has the same best outcomes. And if that's one thing I've been seeing across these systems, right in the midst of this pandemic when, when it is so challenging, uh, this is a key, um, a key outcome of having an advancing uh, a clinically integrated outcomes model. Thank you so much, Dr. Snowden. Uh, amazing insights, encouragement um, for us to think about how do we weather the storm of the pandemic and, and even longer term, how do we think differently about integrating the supply chain and what we need to do to make it a stronger asset. And I think your advice about making sure that visibility starts at the top is really important for the sustainability of programs like this. So oh, thank pleasure. you so much. My pleasure. We appreciate it. And, and to wrap up, um, if you're wondering how you can learn more, we wanted to just share with you that you can download the See Some White Paper that Ann referenced. Uh, you can also learn more about how Wavemark can help your health systems on the journey and, and to a mature supply chain. The information is listed below. Uh, we would also uh, encourage you, if you're interested to learn more, to reach out to uh, the Wavemark team or any of your partners at Cardinal Health, and we'd be happy to get you connected appropriately. Um, and with that, I would like to turn it back over to the Becker's team to help us take some audience questions. Thank you, Sean and Dr. Snowden, for that fantastic presentation. We will now begin today's question and answer session. Please submit any questions you have by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your dashboard. We will try to get through as many questions as we can. So the first question I have is from Robert, and he wants to know, how do I ensure my hospital sustains maturity once we reach that point? Is there a best practice for audits or evaluations that ensure we don't slip back into old habits that don't support maturity? And Anne, can you grab that one? Yeah, no question. And that's a great question. And and given, you know, the, the model's been out in the market a relatively short time and, of course, at, at the height of a, a very difficult time, but what I am seeing, uh, Robert, specifically, is once the uh, a health system gets, you know, gets that automation starting, that flow of data to the uh, dashboard, which is, tends to be what most people are using, it's almost like, you know, clinicians and health systems leaders respond in such a way that, oh my goodness, I never knew this was even possible and there's no chance we'll ever go back. It, it builds momentum. And, you know, I've been in the health innovation space for a very long time. I haven't seen the, the, the rapid momentum building uh, quite to the degree I'm seeing it in this space, and I expect I'll continue seeing that because it's the first time many, many clinician leaders shared with me, particularly physicians and surgeons, who are often a tough crowd, and said, in like, I have never seen objective data like that. I've been asking for this forever, and, I, and we're finally there. So I have sustaining digital maturity. Once data starts to flow, it's, it's almost, I've never seen it, that it doesn't get embraced and continue uh, because people see the value in it. What I'm also seeing, though, is as you start to un uh, flow, open up that box and create that automation and flow that data, what I'm seeing is health systems can't keep up with the demands to change it faster because the momentum it builds, these, these clinician teams very quickly say, well, if you can make it do that, can you make it do this? So I think the problem's actually on the opposite, not the slowdown, but can you keep up with the rapid fire demand now that they know what's possible and they start to leverage and think about all the many ways you can apply it. So that's what I'm seeing. Again, early days, Robert, but um, ha haven't seen it where someone goes just this far and then it and dies on the vine and 
in favor of another, of another priority um, because the applications are so far reaching. Thank you so much, Dr. Snowden. The next question I have is from Rebecca, and she wants to know, does a health system have to adopt automation technology to achieve top scores on the maturity model? And Sean, can you grab that one for us? Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you, Rebecca, for the question. Dr. Snowden, as always, jump in here if, if I say oh. something incorrect. But I think what we've learned through the conversation today is that automation is, in fact, a key enabler for achieving greater maturity. Uh, what I want to just point out is that that does not absolve us from the fact that we have to do the things that Dr. Snowden talked about, which are some basic data management, data integrity work, number one, which is the only way to achieve automation, right? And the second thing is that in a lot of cases, one of the mistakes that we see customers make is a jump to automation without really focusing on the core workflows and the core processes. And so applying technology in this case to bad processes will not help you achieve greater maturity. It'll help you, agree, uh, you know, achieve faster bad processes, but you have to start from really understanding what, what you're looking for from a, a patient safety, patient outcomes, from a staff satisfaction perspective, make sure that your workflows, your processes support that. You have the data integrity and data governance processes in place to uh, then get to the automation, which does unlock a lot of the other savings and benefits that you discussed, Dr. Snowden. So anything that you would like to add? Uh, no, I would just uh, echo what you've already shared in that the four dimensions of the model, um, I've seen many health systems have great strengths in, in clinical integration, for example, or governance leadership strategies. So if you even if you haven't gotten your automation quite advanced as you'd like to, those other dimensions play a significant role in the score because they're all critical enablers. So uh, just on the scoring side, it would not disadvantage you on the scoring. Great. Thank you. And thank you, Rebecca, for the question. Thank you both so much. So the next question I have, I'd love for both of you to weigh in. And Sean, I'll have you grab it first. So the question is, how can the prime distributor slash manufacturers work cohesively with providers to implement this model to benefit a broader supply chain spectrum? Yeah, great, great question, and I'm happy to start. I, it really does begin with some of the core tenants that we've heard from Dr. Snowden. And so I would, I would put it this way. There has to be a vision and a goal from leadership to be able to drive um, up the maturity chain for a clinically integrated supply chain. Right? That that has to be a commitment that the organization is looking for because that will enable all of the other steps, all of the other components that we've just talked about today to realize those benefits. I think the, the opportunity is for um, that prime distributor or the manufacturer in that case to be able to deploy resources appropriately to help enable that vision, right? And so it becomes some very basic understanding about the goals that you have as a health system, how you're going to measure those goals, and then deploying the resources of, again, those individuals outside of the four walls of the hospitals to help you achieve those goals. And so, Dr. Snowden, other thoughts, please? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, when you look at the manufacturing industry, uh, and, and this is not just for health, this is for all of them, they have extraordinarily sophisticated supply chain infrastructure, knowledge, and expertise. Yeah. So they can be a tremendous resource in expertise. They're also of the opinion, at least the, many of the ones I've interviewed, that if, auto, if supply chain advances in uh, in clinically integrated supply chain advances, it actually solves many challenges for them in terms of making sure every organization they serve have the products they need when they need it right on time. Because those interchanges, electronic data interchange, for example, from an organization right to the manufacturer distributor on, on replenishment, it really uh, shifts for them uh, the efficiency and productivity and forecasting they need. 
So in fact, they have much to benefit from. What's a challenge for them is when if out of the, you know, these 150 NHS trusts, for example, all have 150 different systems that they are being asked to respond to and engage with, that's the hard part. So engaging with them, and that's one of the reasons global standards is embedded early on in the model, so that everyone's speaking the same language, you can accelerate your your digital maturity in this space rapidly, and global standards is something the majority, if not all, all pharmaceutical companies, many, many device manufacturers as well, have already adopted. So it's a matter of a health system's catching up. But I see them as being um, pretty interesting partners that can really advance um, and accelerate and support this work uh, virtually in, in any global jurisdiction. Thank you so much. And that takes us to the top of the hour. So that is all the time we have for today. I want to thank Sean and Dr. Snowden for their excellent presentation and Cardinal Health for sponsoring today's webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day and we look forward to having you join us for future webinars.